Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing the adaptive immune system and immunosuppressants. Okay, so we're looking at uh, the immunosuppressant drugs uh, which stop T-cell activation at the moment. Okay, so we're now at the looking at T-cell activation in more detail than we've ever looked at it before. Okay, so we've seen that signal 1 and signal 2 being delivered to a naive T-cell, whether it be a CD8 positive or a CD4 positive naive T-cell, is going to cause calcium to go up within the cytoplasm of this uh, naive T-cell. The calcium will then bind to apocalmodulin proteins, which are within the cytoplasm of the cell, transforming them into calcium calmodulin complexes, which then bind to this enzyme calcineurin, which is again in the cytoplasm of the cell, and to activate it. Now, calcineurin is a serine threonine phosphatase, so it's going to remove phosphate groups from serine and threonine residues uh, within proteins. Okay, now what's the significance of this? Well, there is a transcription factor which calcineurin is going to activate. Okay, so let's talk about this transcription factor down here. We'll try and squeeze it in here. Okay, so this transcription factor is currently inactive. It's stuck in the cytoplasm of the cell, and of course transcription factors act in the nucleus, they act on the DNA. So if it's in the cytoplasm, it's not doing anything, basically. And it's stuck in the cytoplasm because it's got phosphate groups stuck all over it. And now alarm bells should be ringing, you can see what's going to happen. Okay, so this transcription factor is known as MFAT, which stands for the nuclear factor of activated T cells. Okay, and clearly it was named because it's going to be um, active in activated T cells. So this was where it was first discovered. Nuclear factor of activated T cells. So NF is for nuclear factor, A is for activated, and then the T is for T cells. Okay, so here is the nuclear factor of activated T cells. And at the moment, it's stuck in the cytoplasm. And the reason it's stuck in the uh, cytoplasm is that it has a region here known as the serine-rich region, which has a huge number of serine uh, amino acids within it. Okay, So this is the serine-rich region, also known as the SRR for short. Okay, Now, when the NFAT is in the inactive state, these serine residues within this portion of the protein here are going to be phosphorylated. Okay, so I'll draw um, a little ball coming off to denote a phosphate group here. So, this denotes that these serine residues within the serine-rich region are phosphorylated. Now, okay, I've only drawn one phosphate group. In fact, I might have a, you know, a bit more of a go now. I'll draw a few more phosphate groups. So we've got phosphate groups sticking off all over the place from this serine-rich region. Okay, so here are loads and loads of phosphate groups that are attached onto serine uh, amino acids that are in this serine-rich region. Okay, and these are stopping the nuclear factor of activated T cells from being able to get into the nucleus. So they are trapping it within the cytoplasm. Okay, now, we have just activated an enzyme, which is a serine threonine phosphatase, which removes phosphate groups from serine and threonine residues. Okay, so it's going to come over here and remove these phosphate groups from the serine residues in the serine-rich region of the nuclear factor of activated T cells, and this is going to lead to the activation of this nuclear factor of activated T cells. So all these phosphate groups are going to be taken off. And now what can happen is this nuclear factor of activated T cells, which is now active, can uh, migrate into the nucleus, and there it's going to act on the DNA. Okay, so let's just discuss uh, the basic concept of a um, transcription factor, because I don't think we've discussed it at any point in this video. So I'll just make sure that everyone knows what this is. Okay, so here is the nucleus, let's say, of the cell. Okay, and let's say this is the a bit of DNA here. Okay, now upstream of all the genes in the human genome, in fact in all eukaryotic cell genomes, uh, you have um, what is known as a promoter region. 
Okay, so let's say that this is our gene here, and I'll colour it in in turquoise. So this represents the gene. This is the piece of DNA that you're actually going to transcribe and then translate and produce a protein that is made from this piece of DNA. Okay, however, upstream of it, you have a little region known as the promoter region. Okay, and this is not involved in actually being made into a protein. So it's not actually going to be made into a protein. Okay, however, it is involved in controlling the expression of the gene. Okay, it controls how much of the protein uh, from this gene that you actually make. So how much gene product you're actually going to produce. Okay, now how does it do that? Well, in order to make the protein for the gene, the enzyme RNA polymerase has to bind to the promoter region, and then it has to work its way along and transcribe the gene, which will then produce mRNA, which will go to the ribosome and be translated into protein. Okay, so the promoter region thereby controls how much mRNA is produced because if the promoter region binds to RNA polymerase with a very high affinity, then RNA polymerases will be binding all the time and this gene will be being transcribed all the time. So you'll get a huge amount of mRNA produced for this gene and therefore that mRNA will be translated into protein and you'll end up with a huge amount of protein. Whereas, if this promoter region binds to the RNA polymerase with a very low affinity, then the RNA polymerase will hardly ever bind, and that means uh, that uh, you'll get hardly any mRNA being produced, and therefore hardly any protein being made, so the gene will have a very low expression. Okay, so promoter regions control how much of the protein for this downstream gene you actually create. Now, what is a transcription factor? Well, a transcription factor is something which binds to promoter regions of certain genes, okay? So it doesn't bind to all promoter regions, but it will pick specific promoter regions that it likes to bind to, okay? Because all promoter regions are different, basically. Uh, for every gene, you'll have different promoter regions. So it'll pick certain promoter regions that it likes to bind to, and it will bind to them and it will affect the affinity of the promoter region for uh, binding RNA polymerase. So you can have transcription factors which are enhancers, okay, which will increase gene expression by increasing the affinity of the promoter region for the RNA polymerase enzyme, thereby uh, the RNA polymerase enzyme will bind to the promoter region more often and you'll get more transcription of the gene to make more mRNA which will then be uh, translated into more protein. Okay, uh, and you can also have transcription factors which are repressors, which will bind to the promoter region, decrease the affinity of that promoter region for RNA polymerase binding, and therefore RNA polymerase will bind less, and therefore you'll get less transcription of um, the gene, and therefore fewer mRNAs being produced, and therefore uh, less protein being produced. Okay, so transcription factors alter the expression levels of genes. So, the nuclear factor of activated T cells is going to come in from the cytoplasm into uh, the nucleus of the cell. It's going to bind to the promoter regions of certain genes, and it's going to increase their expression. Now, which two genes does it increase the expression of? Well, hopefully you should be able to remember Previously, we just um, went straight to this result. We said signal 1 and signal 2 causes the expression of, and it was interleukin 2 and also the interleukin 2 receptor alpha component. Okay, so we produced the interleukin 2 and we also produced the interleukin 2 receptor alpha component. And then this interleukin 2 was secreted from the cell where whilst the interleukin-2 receptor alpha was put in the cell membrane alongside um, the other components of the uh, interleukin-2 um, receptor, okay, the beta and the gamma components, so this is the beta and this is the gamma, which remember were constitutively expressed, whereas the interleukin-2 receptor alpha component wasn't constitutively expressed, 
and the interleukin-2 receptor wasn't functional without the alpha component. So now you've got a functional interleukin-2 receptor on your surface, so this is the whole interleukin-2 receptor, and then the interleukin-2 that you've just secreted will then bind to the interleukin-2 receptor and trigger signal-3, which then caused the full activation of your T-cell. Okay, whether it was a naive CD4 positive or a naive CD8 positive T-cell, and it then differentiated either into a T-helper naught cell if it was a CD4 positive naive T-cell, or a uh, cytotoxic T-cell if it was a CD8 positive naive T-cell. Okay, now we'll look at signal 3 more in uh, a moment, okay? But what the first drugs we're going to look at are going to work by stopping the uh, pathways that we've seen so far. S one of them will work by stopping signal free, but we'll come to that in a moment. Okay, so let's first turn our attention to these drugs which are going to stop signal 1 and signal 2 causing the production of interleukin 2 and interleukin 2 receptor alpha, and are therefore going to stop the activation of these um, T cells because if you don't produce interleukin-2 and the interleukin-2 receptor alpha, you're not going to uh, get signal free, and therefore you're not going to get the complete activation of the T-cell, and therefore it won't differentiate and then it won't proliferate. So you will kill all three of those pathways that we've looked at in the adaptive immune response, okay, the humoral and the two-cell mediated responses. Okay, so we'll look at these drugs in the next video.